most election results in this country are, are not hugely significant as a sort of cycle, um, and the wheel turns, um, and governments come and go. But every now and then there is something which is a bit more than that. And I think 1997 was that. Um, the, the cycle had come to an end. Um, as I said, we'd been in office for, um, since 1979, uh, and that's a hell of a long time. Uh, and people were fed up with this. I don't actually think or remember uh, that we were hated to the extent that is now uh, described uh, by, 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 by most commentators. But people had had enough of us. And they were bored with us, so fed up with us. Um, and Tony Blair rightly perceived that this was more than just a, uh, a cyclical thing. Uh, and he had reshaped uh, the Labour Party. And I believe that actually history will say that that was the biggest, his biggest achievement. That his biggest achievement occurred before he was Prime Minister, of, of remaking, of bringing the Labour Party back into, into the real world. And so he set out, really, and talked endlessly. Uh, one of you, I think you, Matt, you, you're, you're having to study his speeches in extenso. Mm -hmm. And he would find a great deal about the new politics, particularly <coughs> at the beginning, the new way of, of doing things. And I think he genuinely thought that he could do that. But it hasn't actually worked. And we're back with possibly uh, more uh, spin, more cynicism, uh, about politics than before, for two reasons, I think, but this is not my theme tonight, for two reasons, I think, mainly, it was the emphasis on, 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 on spin, on presentation, the fact that you have the, the Prime Minister on the box and on the internet every night, all that is just overdone and has uh, fallen into disrepute, and I think the specific uh, mistake about invading Iraq will also haunt him and overshadow the rest of his life, and in my view, rightly so. Um, so he hasn't actually succeeded uh, in doing what he clearly wanted to do, which is to create a completely new form of politics in this country. And nor, for God's sake, did the Tory party. The Tory party went on in the old way, um, with three successive leaders after John Major, um, believing, you know, feeding on the faithful. The faithful are there. The Tory party is immortal. Uh, it will always get 30% of the vote. Uh, there are lots and lots of people, most of them very nice people, who, who su support that. And there was always the belief that with one more shout, just a bit more energy, just a bit more effort, you could add that extra 8 or 9% to your 10, uh, to your 30, and, and you'd be in. And that belief um, sent the Tory party into uh, a series of uh, election uh, uh, defeats, because it proved not to be so. Um, and now we have uh, a leader who uh, accepts that that old way is not going to work and that the change required in the <coughs> Tory party is much more fundamental. And here I'm going to do a diversion which is extremely selfish in a way because it's also rather commercial. It's a historical parallel and I have uh, two reasons for mentioning it here today. One is that I have today, today, uh, sent to the publishers my uh, biography of Robert Peel. Um, and, you know, when you reach that stage in your lives, as you will, the actual business of actually getting rid of a book with which you've lived for a couple of, or three years and getting it to the publisher is a great one. So it's a, quite a day in my life. And, and, and secondly, because um, a lot of the hard work on that book was done by Ed Young of this uh, college, who's now the uh, your Mellon Fellow at, uh, at, at, at Yale. Um, a job, incidentally, which I strongly uh, recommend, <laughs> having visited him there and knowing how much he's enjoying it. Um, and therefore, that's actually a great asset for this college, which I'm sure uh, some of you are, 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 are well aware of. But in 1832, Peel was faced with the same sort of situation as the Tory leadership uh, in 97, and indeed uh, when David Cameron was elected the intervening years having been uh, misused, lost. Um, the, the Great Reform Bill had been passed in the teeth of Tory opposition. And um, the Tories were then faced with an electorate, quite a large part of which they had campaigned against them having a vote at all. And a large part of the Tory party thought, well, this is the end of politics as we know it. The Duke of Wellington thought, this is the end. I mean, no gentleman will ever be seen in politics again. And not just that. 
but that the, the, the different institutions, the church, the lords, the king, uh, would gradually be, be overthrown. And there was that terrific feeling, with much more justification than the Tories had in 97, because after all, in the run-up to the Great Reform Bill, um, Nottingham Castle had been burned to the ground, um, Bristol had been in the hands of the mob, and lots of old-fashioned people, uh, like Lord Eldon and Lord Sidmouth, uh, believed that um, the guillotine was, you know, only a few months away, <coughs> and that the French Revolution would be coming to England, even though we'd beaten Napoleon, etc., etc., that actually the guillotine would be there, uh, and everything was going to collapse. Peel, the son of a cotton manufacturer, uh, Harrow and Christchurch, but nevertheless basically uh, a cotton manufacturer's son, kept silence. He'd opposed the reform bill like everybody else, but he kept silence until the moment came when <coughs> my minister, uh, for a few months, the minority government, uh, and he launched really modern British political life. He issued the first election manifesto at Tamworth, his constituency in Staffordshire, and really it said, I am not going to uh, oppose the government, the Whig government, in everything they do. I am going to have constructive opposition. When they do things right, I will support them against the radicals. Uh, and I'm not going to oppose change. I'm going to favour change, provided it's in line with the traditions of this country. And there are abuses, and we must root them out. And with that went an appeal to people of property, an appeal to an, an, an organisation, constituency associations, um, money raising, registering to vote, all those kind of things quite new uh, got underway in the 1830s. And, and Peel therefore launched the party from being the Tory party, the Duke of Wellington and the aristocracy, to being a conservative party of, uh, based on a respect for property and tradition, but accepting the need for change and efficient change. Peel was an extremely efficient man. Uh, and, 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 and there was a huge change coming out of a perception that you needed to change uh, and you had to ram through that change even against the people who, who, you, who, 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 who thoroughly uh, uh, disliked it. Um, so there is a parallel, I think. Um, and I'll just say one more word about uh, Peel. It, it, this is not really commercial because the book's not coming out until June and you're yeah. not about it by now. <laughs> Peel gets, a, on the whole, a, a, a baddish press, uh, because, and, and, and because he was a boring man. He, he, his, his sentences are very long-winded. His speeches were long-winded. Um, and uh, he was very abrupt and, and rough with people whom he didn't know. He was shy, basically. He was conscious he was the cotton manufacturer's son. And, and all these things worked against him and worked against him in his reputation. He was succeeded by the man, eventually by the man who destroyed him. Israeli, uh, who had all the wit, uh, all, all the style, um, which um, actually didn't achieve very much when in power, but has achieved his place in history. So every leader of the Tory party is furnished by speechwriters with great quotes from Israeli, which is terrific, and, and so on. Um, but actually, actually, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't wash. Uh, Peel was the man who did things. Who, who cut the tariffs, who repealed the corn laws, who let the Catholics in the House of Commons. And he's really never, never accomplished anything of that kind at all. What he did do uh, was uh, coin phrases, ideas, uh, which have lasted. Uh, the big phrase, one nation, comes from Disraeli's novel, Civil, a very good novel indeed. Uh, but Peel was the man who actually did it, who actually re reduced, who actually took a huge amount of trouble over the poverty of people who had no vote because he believed that there was one nation, even the people who didn't have the vote. Um, and he bequeathed, and therefore, you know, he led the country into free trade. And his, his legacy is a huge one.